Good evening, church. Welcome. We are delighted that you are here with us tonight. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Luke chapter 7, 18, I think it is now, and uh, talk about blind Bartimaeus. We want to give worship and praise to Jesus and invite him to be present. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, our thanks and our praise to you that you have given us this wonderful day on which to give worship, to give praise, to serve you with joy and gladness. We do pray that your power and your presence would come down over us, that you would fill us with the warmth of your love, that you would teach us, instruct us in your word. Grow us in grace, O oh Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with us in song. We're going to put the words up on the screen. Sing along. Can I 
praise the Lord. Lord. It's been a good group of songs giving praise and uh, our worship to Jesus. We're going to take some time and reset things, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer. Lots and lots and lots of things to pray about. Uh, there's trouble everywhere. The earthquakes that devastated so much of uh, Syria and of uh, uh, Turkey, and then there's uh, all kinds of storms all around, tornadoes as well as snowstorms. And in the middle of all of that, there's us. Yeah, we need his help too. So we're going to join together here and uh, lift our hands and give our voice to Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is our hope. Let's pray. God Almighty, King of the universe, we lift up our hands to you. We worship you. We invite you to come into our hearts and lives and and to help us, to help us be your people, your servants. Lord, earnestly we ask your presence. We ask the fullness of the power of the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us, that you would cause your word to come alive for us. O oh Lord, earnestly we pray on behalf of those that are suffering the, the storms in California, have people locked away without food and uh, without a way to get out and uh, people on the east coast have suffered tornadoes and and jesus we just pray that your comfort your strength would come down over all of us we've had weeks and weeks of snow after snow and and we praise you and rejoice in you for the moisture but we really need the sunshine too lord and when we invite you to bring that sunshine onto us that we might enjoy the warmth of your your son oh lord earnestly we hold up this county this town this state this nation to you these are troubled times these are times when when people are struggling to know what's right when philosophies and human ideas have have taken over and people don't know where to turn. They don't know what to believe. Lies are told everywhere. And terrible, terrible things are promoted on the TV and on the computer. Lord, our country has come to dishonor you. We are failing to bow our knees. We are failing to repent. We're failing to invite you to take over and to run our nation for us and we hold up to you Lord our failure and ask your forgiveness cleanse us O oh Lord help us to rise above the tide of of the struggle and strife on this earth help us to serve each other and to love each other and to give to each other the fullness of the power of the presence of your Holy Spirit Jesus, we do pray that Highway 2, the Sunset Highway run, that runs through this town, it zigs and it zags as it heads through our town. And we pray that you would use that road, that you would dedicate that road to the glory of your name and that people, people would cross that road, drive on that road and suddenly have an urge to turn to you and to turn to your word. That you would open our eyes and our hearts that we might flood this land with the power of your presence and the encouragement of, of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be strong in you and in your word. Give us your peace that passes all understanding. We do pray for our leaders, all of them, from the president down to the county supervisors. And we hold up to you our emergency responders, our firemen and our EMTs and, and our police protection. Oh, Lord, earnestly protect those people. They help us. They are here 
to serve you even if they don't know that. Jesus, we ask these things that you might be glorified and teach us this day from your word. Bring, bring to life the words in Luke 18 that we might give you honor and glory and praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're looking at Luke 18, and I want to just pick this up, and I'm you know, uh, going to read from 35 through the end of the chapter, verse 43. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. So when I was about 12, we had a neighbor named Craig. And Craig, Craig learned in scouts all about building a campfire. They taught him the proper way to set up a campfire and the proper way to, to make that campfire burn brightly and keep him warm all night and cook his meal. And boy, he was happy with that. That, that just really grabbed Craig's heart. And Craig was then on a mission. His task needed doing. He had to do it. He needed to prove that the lessons from scouts had sunk into his heart and he had to build a campfire, right? That, that was under his belt and he had it down and he was going to make it happen. That wasn't the only thing under his belt when he finished burning off the neighbor's yard and the empty lot. Um, yeah, the dry grass lit up and his little campfire turned into two acres of fire. You see, men are fixated, boys included, on the task that's in front of them. If there's something in their heart that they think they have to do, that they think they must do, that they want to do, and want to do badly enough, they don't want women, maps, or instructions getting in their way. They want to get it done. Right? You ladies all know this. Well, those newly appointed apostles were on a mission. Like Craig, they had to get her done. They were marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, and they were going to get Jesus into that capital as king of all. They were leading the way. The triumphant come, king was with them, and they were leading the way. They were, they were being apostles. They were in charge. And boy, the, nothing, nothing was going to get in the way of that mission. And like Craig, uh, maybe the belt needed to use, be used a little differently. Step aside, blind Bartimaeus. The triumphant king is passing by and on his way to Zion and, and it will be beautiful when he gets there. But Bartimaeus would have no part of their pushy, I know what's best male dominance. And that's what was going on. They thought they knew. You know, I've, I've met people my whole Christian life <coughs> that actually believed that what they thought was true, God agreed with them. 
And that's what's going on with these apostles. Not only are their, their dominant male characteristics jumping out of their bodies and, and they're marching along leading, leading this group of 120 disciples with Jesus in the middle of it, but they thought they knew better than Jesus about what ought to be done. They didn't catch all the lessons about love and ministry that Jesus had for them. And it didn't sink into their hearts so that that was what was dominant in their mind. No, they had to get to Jerusalem. They had to get Jesus to Jerusalem. They had come down through Galilee and between Samaria and the, and the Gentile land at the end of the Sea of Galilee and down along the Jordan River and up to Jericho and here's blind Bartimaeus in their way. He was told to shut up, not to bother Jesus with something as petty as his blindness. He wouldn't have any part of it. Bartimaeus didn't shut up. He yelled all the louder, Jesus, have mercy on me. Now, you know, a crowd of 120 people shuffling along and talking and laughing and uh, maybe, maybe singing. We don't know what they were doing, but there would be noise. And Bartimaeus was convinced that he had to be heard and convinced that Jesus was the solution to his problem. And he kept crying out. Sternly, sternly they told Bartimaeus to shut up. I don't know about you, but I learned very young that a stern voice and a stern face and being warned meant that pain will soon follow. Bartimaeus didn't stop. That did not stop him. He was sternly told to shut up. He was sternly told to leave Jesus alone. They're on a mission. They have to get this done. They have to get him to Jerusalem. And Bartimaeus and his blindness didn't matter. We're like that a lot. We think we know what's best. We think we know what ought to be done. We think we know what we should do. And whether the roadmap says that, whether or not the instructions say that, whether or not others agree with us, we're going to go and we're going to get her done. That's the apostles in this passage. We don't know how Bartimaeus knew that Jesus was God in the flesh. We don't know how he knew their, his real identity. All we know is that he knew it, and when he heard it was Jesus, he had to have Jesus' hand touch him and restore to him the eyesight that he had lost and the life maybe that he had lost as well. And Bartimaeus was more focused on his mission than were the apostles who thought they knew what they were doing and who thought they were in charge. And after all, this, this little beggar here along the side of the road wasn't important to them. They were long and slow on learning something that Jesus had tried to teach them for three years. You see, the hope and love of God starts with how we treat people. And they were not treating people as though they were important. What was important is what they were doing and where they were going and what was going to happen in Jerusalem, not the people around them. And they were wrong. And Jesus always had a quiet way of letting them know that they were off track. He does the same thing with us. When we're way out here and he wants us way over there, he lets us know. Sometimes it's not so gentle. But in this case, he just showed them up. You see, in English, our word love simply means to care. That's, that's uh, the root word behind Liebe, which is a German word for love. Uh, the, it, it comes along through us etymologically, but the word just simply means to care. That's all it means. We use it serendipitously for 
our dog, our wife, our car, and our pet water buffalo. Yeah. Oh, man, do I love that water buffalo. Oh, that thing is so good. Pulls me along along the highway. Keeps my cart going. No. You see, we can have a lot of caring, or we can have a little bit of caring. And if we don't care enough, then our love does not match up with the needs of others. We can care a lot. We can care a little. We can romantically call it all love. And it doesn't matter whether it's our dog, our wife, or our car, or our water buffalo. That's the way love, the word love works in English. In Hebrew, on the other hand, love means to give, ahava. It means to, to be generous, to be sacrificial, to give self to others. And, and so all through the Old Testament, ahava is used to express God's love and our love for, for his creation. But that word is sacrificial. It's not a generic, oh, I care. Yeah, gee, I love you, but I don't do anything to show it. To have love in Hebrew is to be sacrificial in how that love is shared. But in Greek, then, love has a very similar purpose, and it means to copy something, to match yourself to something or someone so closely that, that you breathe when they breathe. Yeah. It means to breathe after, actually. And so you're, you're matching your breathing to someone. And to have that kind of love is sacrificial, just like the Hebrew word. It's, it's giving self. And these apostles, keep quiet, Bartimaeus. And sternly they told him to shut up. Yeah. Because Jesus couldn't be bothered with something as lowly as your blindness. Now these are the guys that had seen a 12-year-old raised from the dead, had seen five loaves of bread and two fish turned into a meal for 5,000 men, not counting women and children, had seen Jesus walk on the water, had seen Jesus still the waves and quiet the storm on the water, had seen 4,000 people fed, had seen multiple, multiple healings of people, people that were lepers, people that were paralytics, people that were uh, uh, suffering from all sorts of diseases. They saw the widow of Nain's son ra rose from the dead. They saw Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after he'd been in the grave for four days. They had seen miracles abound in, um, and pile up on top of miracles, literally. And they didn't quite get the fact that that was a gift of sacrificial love from the hand of God. And so Bartimaeus didn't count. But you know what? Our smallest problems are still God's concern. Our smallest problems. Big ones like being blind are, are even more his concern. The question is, do we love him enough to seek him? Do we love others enough to help? Jesus simply answered Bartimaeus and said, Receive your sight. He asked him what he wanted, and he says, I want to receive my sight. And Jesus said, Receive your sight. There it is. It's a gift. You see, that's, that's love in action. That's giving sacrificially. And yes, there is time to do that when you're marching up to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, and your mission is so important. Love said the trust that Bartimaeus put in Jesus made him well. And Jesus says that right here in verse 42. Your faith, which really should be translated as trust, 
because trust is active and faith is inactive, has made you well. You see, it, it's a verb instead of a noun. And that faith, that trust that Bartimaeus put in Jesus and his belief that Jesus could give him his sight is what made Bartimaeus well. And I hope, but we're not told, that the apostles were a little sheepish that night at supper about what they had done. Immediately, Bartimaeus regained his sight and began following Jesus and glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. I'm sure the disciples smirked, but Bartimaeus followed Jesus on the road shouting praises. Yeah. He followed him on the road shouting praises because Jesus had done something tremendously wonderful for him, had demonstrated to him the love of God in a way that the apostles hadn't caught. They hadn't learned that lesson. And they really didn't learn that lesson until after the Holy Spirit came down upon them at Pentecost. And then they got it. And then they too became sacrificial in loving others. If they truly loved him, they would have shouted praises with him as he walked along. But what about you? What about us? Are we so filled with God's love that, that we want what Jesus wants instead of what we want, or are we on our mission? It's got to be done this way. There's no other way to do it but this way because this is the way it's always been done and this is the way I want it done. Or are we presuming something for Jesus that he doesn't presume for us? Those are questions we have to ask. And as we're looking at Jesus on his way to the cross in these passages, the truth is that we have to be walking with him, not ahead of him, not behind him, but with him, doing the things of the kingdom that Jesus wants us to do. And we just simply need to believe. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you for, for the silliness and the stupidity of the apostles because, Lord, we're just like them. Forgive us our selfish whims and help us to serve you in the way that you want to be served. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're pleased that you came along. Join us again next week. Have a great week.